Hi, this is Misha. We have a video on the evolution of the rifle from the AR-15 originally as it was, to the XM-16, to the M16A1, M16A2, and the M16A4. So I thought we'd bring out the carbines. Here, we have a Colt XM-177, XM-117. Oh, so yeah, 177. E2. This is the Troy reproduction. Some auto standing in for it. We have another. This is an Air Force GUU 5P. GU 5P. And it's represented by the Troy G GAU 5AA. Although it's been modified by me. Then we have a Colt M4 carbine, the quite essential, the basic, the original. This is a Colt LE 6921 type. And finally we have an FN M4A1 represented by the FN Collector Series M4 carbine. This is just kind of the, the little evolution of the carbine family. The AR-15 started off as a 20-inch rifle with a fixed buttstock. And by 1963, it was really starting to make some waves. So the following year, Colt started to work on a carbine. Actually, Colt wanted an entire family. They called this family the Car-15. C for Colt and then AR-15. And they were planning to do all kinds of things. Uh, survival guns, uh, light machine guns submachine guns, carbines, rifles, DMRs, whatever they could think of. They uh, Port firing guns uh, as they became. All kinds of things. The first carbine model was the Colt 605. It was just an XM16E1 with its 20 inch barrel cut down to 15 inches and then the three-pronged flash hider screwed back on. The barrel was re-threaded, screwed back on. This was the first carbine. It still had the full-length gas system, still had a fixed E1 style buttstock, nothing else was changed, including the gas port. You have the muzzle very close to the gas port on this early prototype. And this meant it was not that reliable because there was essentially no dwell time. At this point, Colt never thought to just enlarge the gas port. It was just a step. That said, you know, you are lobbing off five inches from a gun that's already not terribly long, so it was quite a bit handier. Not that much lighter because we're just shortening the barrel. But the 605 was just a, really a prototype. It never went much of anywhere. Next, we have the Colt Model 607, which is a very interesting gun, and I really want to build a clone, clone of one one day. The 607 is important. Even though Colt only made 200 of them, give or take, and they were pretty much all made by hand, it did actually see limited field use, field testing, over in East Asia. Uh, no one really knows, maybe 50, 40 or 50 made it over. They were used a little bit feedback was given. The 607 was known to the military as the GX5857. I never really have been able to get a good idea of why this name was given, but it seems to have been a very highly experimental, highly trialed gun that was never intended for adoption or even full production. It was more of a proof of concept. And the reason I say that, it had a lot of handmade parts. It was the first to have an adjustable butt stock. It had two positions. And the stock was a cut down A1. And it was on what we already would know today as a carbine length receiver extension buffer tube. So the 607 introduced the carbine length tube and thus the carbine buffer. But the buttstock was very labor and time intensive to make, but very cool. Likewise, 
it was the first to introduce the short 7 inch gas system we know today in the carbine and it used cut down A1 handguards. So the furniture was essentially made by hand at Colt, but we we're introducing the carbine length gas system and extension. The barrel was 10 inches, so it was halved from the rifle. Early on, these would just have the three prong flash rider. Again, though we do not have much dwell time because the muzzle ends just right in front of the gas port, so reliability wasn't great. And this led to Colt creating the first of the moderators. It was a three and a half inch extension moderator, which is essentially there to build up back pressure. It was also there to control uh, the noise, but these early moderators really did not act as flash hiders as such. The 607 led directly to the 609 and the 610. Now these were the first in what we know today as the XM177 series. The 609 was the XM177E1 and the 610 was just the XM177. The only difference was the 09 had the forward assist on this one here and the 10 did not the army was mostly interested in the 09 it would have the 10 inch barrel and the short gas system from the 607 as well as the shorter receiver extension however it would go to a new pattern of sliding butt stock what we know today is a car 15 stock made of treated aluminium metal alloy and it would introduce the now very familiar car 15 pattern handguards the round style early ones would have a straight delta ring but then they would go to a uh, tapered ring later in production in the series to make the handguards easier The 609 would also be fitted with the moderator on its 10 inch barrel. It would use the same barrel assembly essentially as the 607. And it was quite successful. They would uh, actually start to introduce a newer pattern of moderator later in production. It's four and a quarter inches long. It would act as a flash hider. It also acted as a minor sound suppressor. So it's controlling flash and, bla flash and blast. <laughs> but it still could not be used as a grenade launcher with the 10 inch barrel. The US Army would order about 2,800 of these around 1966, 1967 in that era there. Right as the A1 was being adopted. The Air Force would also select it and we start the GAU-5 series and then move on to the GAU-5A. These would see service in Vietnam in the early days and they were essentially popular with people on patrol. They were much lighter and shorter than the standard M16A1 which was just going into adoption at the time. The reliability still wasn't as good as it could have been, but it was certainly better than the earlier first couple of carbine models. The Air Force would purchase a really undetermined number, but again, the, mili the Army would have only a few thousand of the original XM-177E1. And if you see, this has a lot of the features we know today, but it's still lightweight. It still has all the A1 features like A1 lower. This would be finished in the gray originally, forward assist, A1 rear sights. This was the Vietnam gun. The four and a quarter inch moderator would really help out as well. However, there's still room for improvement. 
Soon, Colt would introduce the Model 629 with the Ford Assist and the Model 630 without the Ford Assist. And the major difference was that the barrel was extended from 10 inches to 11 and a half. Now this would increase dwell time quite significantly. It would help decrease the noise and the flash by having more burnt powder. We're increasing reliability, we're increasing accuracy a bit. Now none of these would have bayonet lugs because there's no really way to attach a bayonet. But with the longer spacing here, we can attach a under barrel grenade launcher. At the time it would have been the XM48 and so we would receive a grenade ring as it's called behind the moderator. They would retain the same moderator and today these are the originals are known as suppressors to the ATF because they do reduce the noise signature by a few decibels at most but because they did have internal baffling and functioned as a minor sound suppressor. That's how the ATF classifies them. That's how it goes. This was classified as the XM-177E2 by the U.S. Army. The Air Force version without the forward assist would be the GAU-5A-A, which Troy also makes a version of. Now the Army would only acquire a little over 500 of these because they were picking them up in the late 60s. And honestly, production of this whole series was, was over by the end of 1970, the, the first successful carbine series. Most of the guns would not have chrome line barrels. Very late production XM-177s could have a chrome line bore, but most of them would only have a chrome line chamber. Otherwise, they would have the same basic features as all the, the A1s made around the same time. Of course, we have a different handguard because it's shorter. We have a round cap. All the stuff you really, you know, are familiar with today because a lot of it's been carried over. Of course, we have an A1 pistol grip still because that was the era. The CAR-15 stock. The carbine buffer becomes solidified with this gun. We still have a pencil profile .625 barrel. Sling swivels. This has a early type sling. These are actually uh, straps that they mo like a general purpose, general use strap that they modified to to work on these. And these were never officially adopted or standardized, but they were of course in use in the military, and they were very desirable in the military because of their lightweight. They were also amongst the first guns to have the 30 round mags. 20 round was still standard issue, but a lot of the earliest 30 round mags sent over to Vietnam would be put in the carbines. Moving into the 70s, this was originally one of the Troy GAU AAs that I've turned into a GUU 5P in the 70s. Colt would go away from making the 11 and a half inch barrel. This was mostly because of the moderator. The U.S. passed new restrictions on the exportation of sound suppressors, so it made it more difficult and troublesome for Colt to use, even for other militaries, select fire guns to send them over with the suppressor. So what they did, instead of having an 11 and a half inch barrel with a four and a quarter inch moderator, they just took the barrel and extended it out to 14 and a half inches and then started using the standard A1 flash hider. Now this barrel is actually 16 inches because legal, but they went to a longer barrel length, really just to try to meet commercial necessity and comply with new government restrictions. However, almost by accident, they stumbled upon a really good length. By going to the longer barrel again, they restored the original dwell time, the original positioning between the muzzle and the gas port that was featured 
on the M16A1. It also meant they could take a bayonet again, which is important to some. The most famous of these models was the 653, which was essentially just a model 629, but with a three inch longer barrel. And the US military would purchase a few 653s as older guns would wear out and it is neat. But these were just basically off the shelf commercial purchases. They, they were not officially adopted or anything. Some people would call these the M16A1 carbine. So that was pretty much what happened in the 70s. We're going to a longer barrel. Colt would do several, several different versions, again, for export customers with Ford Assist, without Ford Assist. These are still all in uh, full auto and semi-auto select fire. They would have introduced an SP-1 carbine, semi-auto only, in 1977. However, it used a slab side lower, not the correct full fence lower that the military guns would have had. In 1982, the U.S. military adopted the M16A2 rifle with a heavier barrel and, more importantly, a 1 in 7 twist rate for stabilizing the new 62 grain projectiles. There are also many other updates to the A2 that we'll get into in just a minute, but a lot of these changes started to be carried over to the carbines. Up until the 80s, the buttstocks were still made out of the alloy, the metal, aluminium, and they were on a two-position tube. Now they would keep using the two-position tube throughout the 80s, but they would go to what's known today as the Fiberlite CAR-15 buttstock. This is made out of a polymer material. It's lighter and it's more durable than the metal. The metal is kind of neat for a retro standpoint, but it dents, of course, and it has some corrosion possibilities. The polymer, lighter and cheaper, and also doesn't dent and cannot really corrode. So that's one of the major changes to the guns in the 80s. And really where the, um, where the whole series ends with the so-called M16A1 type guns. This gun here, what the Air Force would do when the one in seven twist was adopted Instead of just buying all new guns, they would take their older carbines and rebarrel them with new 14 and a half inch, and some people even report a few 16 inch barrels from Colt with the new twist rate. These would still be a thin pencil profile, but with the new rate, and of course these would all be chrome lined with bayonet lugs and such. So they would either rebarrel existing uppers. Or they would just put a whole new upper on, even converting some of the old M16, or I should say even XM16s from the 60s, rifles, into carbines with new stocks and yeah, so on and so forth. So the Air Force would make a big mutt salad of various guns under the kind of umbrella name of GUU5P. And that's what I've done here, just because I wanted to. And I wanted a carbine length gun. It's very light and handy. So the Air Force had a whole host, and still even to some extent today does, of kind of non-standardized carbines in service. They really, really liked the carbine in the Air Force. And that's what I've done here. Moving on to more modern, and this is where guys, I'm sure I'll make some mistakes because I'm not much into too much of the modern stuff. I like the old history. <laughs> The M4 is really nothing more than one of the older XMs that's updated with the modern features. The transitional model was the Colt 723. This is an interesting gun because we have a 14 and a half inch barrel, still pencil weight, one and seven twist, but it's gaining A2 features. It'll go to a round forward assist. It'll have an A2 lower sometimes, not always. It'll have the newer Fiberlite stock, so on and so forth. The thing about the, the, the 723 Colt would use essentially whatever parts it had on hand. 
And this is what you might call a Black Hawk Down carbine. Other people call it an M16A2 carbine because it's adopting a lot of the A2 features. The military would acquire these in small numbers in the 80s, and Colt, of course, would have export customers. Next would be the 727, which was the same, except we're going to the heavier profile barrel with the step, that's now famous on the M4, for the, uh, the 203 grenade launcher. So the, the 727 is the immediate forerunner and really what led to the XM4, the trials version of this gun here. Now often, these would have, oh, let me back up one thing, the 723 would have retained the A1 rear sight. The 727 would start to introduce the A2 and by the XM4 trials, we're going to the A2 rear sight on the carbine. These would all have 14 inch barrels, bayonet lugs, carbine length gas system, still have the same carbine length gas or excuse me, receiver extension. Early ones would still have the two position and the fiber light stock, A2 pistol grip. And the early XM4s and even M4s would have a fixed carry handle. Essentially, it's just, the, as I said, a carbine with the A2s. It'll have the brass deflector, it'll have the modern forward assist, It'll have the markings on the right side for the safety selector. And this would be officially adopted as the M4 in 1994. And it would replace a lot of rifles in service. It too would receive updates. One of the first would be this remove. it would go to the removable carry handle with a pick rail underneath for attaching optics. If you notice, these handguards are kind of ovular shaped. This was pretty common back when, but nowadays with so many M4s coming with rails, some might be not all that familiar with them. These actually are double heat shield handguards that were originally made for the M4. They're a pretty distinctive M4 part. So the M4 had three round bursts as standard. And we're still using the medium heavy profile carried over from the M16A2. We're light under the handguard and we're heavy out front with the step for the 203 would be standardized on the M4. The carry handle would feature A2 rear sights. This is slightly raised for being on the pick rail and the front sight was raised, this front sight base I should say was raised accordingly. The front sight itself is the same. We have the round Ford Assist, a two brass deflector, a two port door, a two lower. Pretty well standard on that. The sling swivel in the front was moved from the bottom to the side on this block, which can be reversed to go on right or left. The earliest guns, as, as I said, had fixed carry handles, but this is very quickly replaced with the removable. The earliest guns would have one of Kurt, uh, finally Colt would go away from the two position only tube to a four early, early on here in the 90s. But we still use the CAR 15 fiber light stock for a time. This M4 pattern of stock was not introduced into the late 90s, even 2000 in some units. We have two sling attachment points, one like on the CAR-15 at the top, and then a more standard one at the bottom. It's also a little bit beefier of a stock. Again, most of you probably are very familiar with the M4, but this is the unadorned original style before all the rails and, and whatnot. And this replaced the majority of M16 rifles in service with the Army and so on and so forth. The Marines would hang on to the, the M16 a little longer, though. And this was the quintessential rifle in use during the early days of Afghanistan and the Second Iraq War. What's interesting is it's still using the same gas system length, a very similar 
same length of receiver extension, very similar to the original Colt 607. And we're using still a 14 and a half inch barrel, which really Colt would stumble upon in the 70s with guns like the uh, 653. So there's a lot of carryover. Yeah, we've gone to the heavier profile barrel. It's a 0.75 diameter, except for, of course, the step down and everything. And, of course, we have the more fancy pants rear sight. But, really, you can see the, the direct lineage. And, of course, 30 round mags by this point would be completely standard. As the 20th century would wear on, the uh, M4 would be updated. And there were several programs and several different accessories. And what this is here is an M4A1 semi-auto clone. Now, in military parlance, the difference between an M4 and an M4A1 is the fire mode. M4 is semi and burst. M4A1 is semi full auto. After trying out burst mode with the M16A2 and M4 for some time, many went back to the full auto and it became back to honestly being standardized. Rails began to be added, much like with the M16A4. You'll see different rail systems over the years. This one is one of the Knight's Armament, two-piece. There is also a Daniel Defense rail system that was in use. This one still has the front sight tower, obviously. The barrel is the same, 14 and a half inch, bayonet lug. Still one and seven twist, chrome lined, yada yada. I didn't really have much on this one, just a knight's foregrip. Obviously, whatever was needed for the mission could be attached. Lower is the same. This has the ambidext ambidextrous safety, which started to appear during the Second Iraq War on some guns. Instead of having the carry handle, your modern carbines are going to have some type of optic. This is just a primary arms I put on here. It's not like I need to put a lot of money and time into optics. We have a Maytech, Matech, flip rear sight, same as on the M16A4. Most of these would have the M4 buttstock. I just put this B5 SOP mod copy. This is a copy of the LMT stock on this one, just to be different, and it is a comfortable stock. You'll start to see more varied stock designs because these guns were being used in combat and development was happening. This one has the storage compartments for batteries or whatnot. Also has a QD sling point in the back here for detaching. But this is, and of course now we have a Magpul P-Mag in it, which is becoming standard in the military, replacing the older metal mags. They really are better. They don't dent, they don't rust. They either work or they're broken. And this is an example of not the latest, of course. But it's an M4A1. Now one thing that started to happen, now there are plenty of M4A1s with the M4 profile barrel that's skinny under the handguard as well, but because we're going back to full auto fire, they did start to do heavy profile barrels under the handguards with more recent models as well. So something like this does have the heavier profile barrel. For those of you who own Colt LE 6920 SOCOMs, the same kind of barrel where it's thicker. They did this obviously for better heat dissipation, basically to have a better heat sink in full auto, to keep it from going to the cook-off point as fast. 
And despite all kinds of programs like the SCAR program to potentially adopt replacements for this gun, the M4 and its cousins are still standard issue throughout most of the military. Even the Marines have finally retired the M16A4 and are going to M4 types because it works. And really it's amazing how little the core design has changed since the XM177. A lot of the same cues and features are in this that were in the original. And that was the point of this video. Sorry if it seems rushed, guys. It's been one of those days where the phone keeps ringing, things keep happening, and I feel rushed, and I've got to get this done pretty quick. And again, I'm not an AR-15 expert. There are much more informed people out there. I just had mine out today and thought I'd show them on camera a bit. But yeah, this was uh, kind of a brief rundown of the evolution of the carbine and U.S. military service from not even being adopted, you know, being a, a substitute standard gun at best with the XM177 to completely standard issue for all the branches with the M4 and M4A1. Yes, there's also the Mark 18 series, which is its own creation. Colt never completely abandoned the shorter barrel. They would do what they called the M4 Commando with an 11 and a half inch barrel. So the same length as the original XM177. They would just go to the heavier profile out front. Essentially it's an M4 but with a short barrel is what the, um, the M4 Commando is. This would lead to the Mark 18, which is a militarized version, military spec version. And it would have a 10.3 inch barrel, which is really the shortest possible barrel you can get and still have reliability. And even though the, the muzzle is right up against the gas port again on the Mark 18, they've learned lessons over the last 50 years. They've increased the port size, the gas port size. They've also changed the buffer going to the heavier H2 buffer. And they've in, in, improved the extractor to compensate for the weaker dwell time. That's something I didn't mention guys. The original guns like this would have a standard weight buffer. We would go to a heavier buffer, an H marked, with the M4s. And with the M4A1s, a lot of times you'll find them with H2 extra heavy buffers, or even H3s and even beyond, but I don't know that the military gets into that. But So the buffer weights would increase as time would go by. In conclusion, I'll say that after 50 years of development, the AR-15 platform, especially the carbine because it's in use today, really is a, a very perfected gun. Its reliability is a, as good as anything now, and uh, soldier satisfaction seems to be quite high with them. You don't hear a lot of complaints. They, they seem to be plenty accurate for what they need to do. There are always outlying stories, of course, and we can do a whole video on myths and realities of the AR. Maybe we should one day, but um, for now I just wanted to kind of give the rundown of the carbon history. Again, I'm sorry for the rush nature of this, but you know how it goes. End of the day and many other things pressing me to get done. So we do appreciate you tuning in and sticking with us today. If you have any questions or want to share your own carbines, especially retros, we'd really appreciate that because retro carbines are cool. We do have a full video on these Troys. So if these interest you, check that out. As always, this is Misha. And please tune in again soon for more hopefully unique and interesting videos. We'll catch you then.